Hello and good afternoon out there in the Conscious Living Network world, wherever you may be watching in the world today. My name is Mark Curran and we are here on Conscious Living Radio. We air on 100.5 CFRO FM in Vancouver. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Devin Christie. She's a family physician with a focused practice in multidisciplinary pain management and she works right here in Vancouver at Change Pain Clinic. Devin is also a registered therapeutic counselor with training in relational somatic therapy for trauma resolution. Her extensive training also includes certification in functional medicine and she is a certified teacher of MBSR, which we're going to find out more about that, which is a mindfulness-based professional training institute and uh, interpersonal mindfulness. She is also a certified teacher of Kundalini Yoga, which is something I'm quite fond about. Um, and her unique and diverse clinical background uh, is combined with such rich personal experience that enables Devin to deeply understand and synthesize healing across disciplines. Devin, it's a pleasure to have you here today. How are you? Thanks so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really well, thanks. Great. Well, it's been a beautiful weekend here in Vancouver, and, you know, we've got some interesting things happening. It's been a really interesting world, and as a doctor, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have this conscious conversation with you about, you know, some of the innovations you're seeing in, the, in your work and how COVID is affecting maybe your patients, how what you're seeing on your end and really what you guys are doing about it. I know there's a bunch of interesting things happening in our local healthcare system. So uh, I look forward for you sharing <clears throat> uh, more about that. But maybe tell us who you are and a little bit more about yourself and how you kind of you know maybe became a doctor and you know what what your passion is in the medical field. Oh sure, yeah, I'm happy to share that background with you. So uh, I as you kind of just read my bio, so um, that kind of covers the disciplines I've studied. Um, but, you know, I became a doctor, uh, I was angling towards that, I would say, from a young age and uh, rebelled a little bit in high school but and considered other options, but really studying life sciences and understanding cellular biology and how life perpetuates itself and understanding genetics and all of that just seemed the most fascinating thing you know learning about life that's me I'm alive so um, so I so then I pursued health sciences and then um, you know was definitely on my own healing journey uh, at that time as well through my late teens and 20s um, I struggled with an eating disorder and by the time I did uh, my final year of um, undergrad I actually um, did my my thesis through the Department of Philosophy and looked at the history of medicine and medicalization particularly of women's bodies and of body image and eating related issues. And I, I definitely questioned the paradigm, um, the, the medical paradigm at that point. I was looking at it through like a sociocultural feminist lens. And, um, but then in my gut, you know, my instinct said, you're, you're poised here on the doorstep of medicine. You've worked your butt off to have the grades and everything else to, to go there. And um, I really wanted to understand what was behind my things, um, which were that um, doctors can say things that are actually harmful, not helpful in the context of eating disorders uh, anyway. So so that kind of, I entered medical school, um, a, a relative outlier, I would say, or just maybe with a, a little bit more of a critical eye to what I was learning. And uh, at that time, I was um, teaching yoga. I had found yoga at a, at a very young age. I started practicing at age 17. Initially, as a um, a means to maintain my physical stamina so I could continue running long distance, which was kind of part of my eating disorder, really. So I came to it through that, which was actually a kind of grace because it's actually the yogic path and starting to dive into the more spiritual side of, of yoga and, and Vedantic philosophy that got me on a real true path in my own healing. So um, so these things have kind of paralleled. I, I went through medical school and knew that that was really a stepping stone in my career, becoming a doctor, and that there was much to learn yet um, that wasn't necessarily covered in my medical training. So uh, I endeavored to, to learn as much as I could to fill in the gaps, which was some of the trainings you listed in my bio, like studying with the Institute for Functional Medicine in the U.S., which has much more of a lifestyle focus, and it's 
actually using complexity theory and systems biology and understanding our connection to the earth and ecosystems and our microbiome and all of that, you know, very fascinating um, uh, body of, of understanding and study. And then also paralleled with, um, I would say, consciousness-based studies like continuing my yogic trainings and then eventually deciding to study uh, to become a certified teacher of MBSR, which that acronym, it means Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which um, I can speak about a little more. It's one of the things I offer at Change Pain Clinic. Well, who doesn't want stress reduction in today's world, right? Well, yes. I mean, that's just it. And, it, you know, this program has been around, uh, MBSR has been around since the mid-80s. It was developed by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn in uh, Boston at the Massachusetts uh, Stress Reduction Clinic, which he founded. And um, it's the most evidence-based, mindfulness-based intervention um, that exists. You know, there's meta-analyses of meta-analyses of studies that have been done looking at MBSR in particular for a variety of health conditions and in healthy individuals as well, including brain imaging studies. And um, so we have a lot of information about really the power of this type of intervention, which is essentially an eight-week curriculum that... Um, encompasses various different types of mindfulness practices as well as mindful yoga and it has an emphasis on experience-based learning and really all the participants um, I, the way that I facilitate is such that they're learning through their own experience and it's actually the innate wisdom that through the design of the curriculum we're cultivating you know everyone has a capacity for mindfulness it's a skill it's learned like learning to play an instrument, you know? So it's, um, so yeah, so those two things par kind of paralleled and I've continued on into other studies as well. Like you mentioned, becoming a trauma therapist too. Um, I kind of just, just kept digging down the rabbit hole, trying to find ways to understand suffering and understand um, why people are, are unhealthy or sick. Uh, and then what are the pathways for true healing to be the emergent property. You know, when you look at systems biology and complexity theory, it's, it's, it's really about emergent properties of all these dynamic things that are happening um, in any given moment of all these interacting systems. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit what brought me here. And um, yeah, happy to share more about what's happening now. Well, I'd be curious. <clears throat> well, first off, I love what you said about experience because I've always said experience is the best teacher. And in some of the trainings I've taken, you know, in coaching and things of that nature, I always say, you know, we want to lead people to their own discovery because if they say it and find it, they're going to believe it. And if we just tell them, you know, they may or may not, it's not the same kind of discovery and experiential process. And that's why with Conscious Living Network and the events that we produce and what we do, we want them to be educational, experiential, and transformational. Yeah. So uh, I really value what, what you had to say there because I think it's a very powerful thing. And I know me, I learn best what I'm doing. That's the yeah. most important thing. I have to be immersed. Show me what to do. Let me experience it. Let me make my own mistakes and figure it out. Um, so I, I can certainly really appreciate that. Now, when you talk about stress and, and if we look at particularly just in the past couple of months, if everything you've learned about stress in, in this, these programs and, and in your work is there a, a simple tool that people can use every day to help reduce their stress? Like something that's not complicated, something that's so simple everybody can do it. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to take a lot of time or be complicated, as you say. I think a lot of what, I think two big contributing factors to the stress burden, and, and there are many, but two big ones right now are definitely uh, the level of information overload and connectedness we have to our devices and to media, as well as just the general level of, of busyness um, that is somehow become the norm in our, in our culture. Um, and, and then also that combined with uh, the, now the fear about a virus and uh, fear of death and fear of, of illness and all of that is huge as well. Um, so I, I think that uh, we really need to be, number one, conscious about 
how much and what sources we're um, taking in with respect to information. Yes. Um, and really, really questioning that and sitting with that. And I was just saying, going to say pausing with that. And pause is actually the foundation of it all. You know, if pausing is the foundation of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Pausing is the foundation of being able to sit and and tune in and distill for ourselves you know what is what is wise and what might be of benefit truly and as i mentioned busyness being this this cultural norm there's not a lot of natural pause in our lives there just isn't and um, and then that's further exacerbated by our connection to devices and information overload. Like we're just kind kind of constantly in the stream of assimilating information. And uh, really, I think a, just a simple thing is for people to learn how to pause. Mm-hmm. And that can simply be um, sitting down, disconnecting, and taking three conscious breaths. A long, deep inhale, a hold, and a slow exhale, which when you prolong your exhale, that immediately starts to kick in more parasympathetic tone in the nervous system, which is that more resting, digesting tone in our nervous system. And uh, and really that has to be, that's that's really it. I mean, it extended uh, periods of doing something uh, mindful, which is essentially doing nothing but observing or, or focusing your attention somewhere, like on your breath or on the sensations in your body. Um, you know, the, the benefits definitely do accrue with time. And some of the literature shows, you know, a, a period of 12 minutes a day might be a sweet spot, like a good, good one to aim for. So it's really not that much time investment. It's just a matter of uh, I think recognizing the importance for ourselves, um, maybe taking stock of our values too, because um, often I think maybe we just are in our habits, habit-driven, condition-driven way of, of being and orienting, and it actually might not be in alignment with when when you really drill down. What is our what are our our deepest our core values? What's most important? to mm-hmm. us in our daily lives and so and then what can be in service to that so i mean that's, that's just something very simple but i think it's just unhooking pausing um and then connecting with breath slowing our breaths down it's essentially slowing down we're all just revved up mm-hmm. and um, what i think we need collectively and individually is the opportunity to to slow down and, that, and that's what we learn in the mindfulness training, the MBSR program, what the participants learn over the eight weeks is uh, they start to see for themselves what benefit there might be to this, this slowing down and how we talk about the stress reactivity cycle, and which is sort of a self-perpetuating cycle of stressor comes in, automatic nervous system response, conditioned reactive response to that activation in the nervous system which then leads to often unhealthy coping strategies which then creates more stressors which then creates more and then it goes around and around whereas when you insert a pause of mindfulness into that and you take stock what are my physical sensations in my body right now how am i feeling even briefly all of a sudden there's a a much broader platform of choice that becomes available Beautifully said, and I, and I think it's interesting too that, <clears throat> excuse me, in in these times, you know, some people have been given, you know, a big pause because they're not working, and yep. some people are busier than ever. Yeah. So there becomes this this whole split even in our society with what's happening, and some people again not working are concerned about money, and some people are so busy still being busy. So I think even in both of those places, it's still important to take that pause. And if you have the time, take some time and enjoy that. And, and you know, because we haven't had this quietness and this stillness 
as long as I can, I'm 53 years old. In my lifetime, you know, feel, every day feels almost like Christmas and New Year's, the way everything is so quiet out there. And mm -hmm. we haven't had that. And it becomes this whole new, you know, frame of living because we can't even for those who go out you can't even I can go to the office today and I can't go down the street and get a coffee or buy lunch you know and that's it, it, it's a very different thing so thank you for sharing that because I think the pause is really really super important yeah and I agree with you you know we we do have this opportunity for collective pause and as you say perhaps some new perspectives that can come from that and it, it would be interesting for the listeners or the viewers to just take a look and say, you know, have I, how has this pause been for me? Have I gone to, you know, binging Netflix and whatever else to, to fill the pause? Because we're not comfortable with, with pause, with spaciousness, with silence, with the unknown. And I mean, essentially, this is what contemplative practices like mindfulness um, cultivate in us is the capacity to, you know, develop equanimity, to be able to um, touch impermanence, that everything is constantly changing. Uh, I know for me, uh, the, the massive upheaval in the world as we know it is actually uncovering a truth that was already there, which is there's nothing ever that we, 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 we try to create stability in our lives, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately on the, on the deepest level, it is groundlessness. And so, to, you know, for me, that's been a, um, something I've been really interested in, in witnessing is just, okay, when those comforts and the stability and the structures that we've come to rely upon to have some sense of control or orientation in our lives are suddenly not there, where do we find ourselves and how do we orient and what what do we lean into in order to find actually a place of center within you know and and can we turn that way and and then what tools might we access to to help in that so that we can move together consciously into this change you know to, to start to say wow what is this exposing collectively what can we what can we maybe set as new priorities with everything that we're learning? Look at the environment. Look at how nature is, you know, thriving in many ways. And, you know, just all, all the ways that we might not actually return to the previous norm. I don't know that that's even possible anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's, you know, what is normal now? Because, yeah. you know, the future in, in this situation is really unknown when they're talking about the vaccines, when they're talking about, you know, travel in relation to that. They're, they're talking about things slowly opening up at events and conferences and things of that nature still being shut down. And it's, it's this real uncertainty. And like you mentioned, people are looking for that security, that safety, that knowing that everything's going to be okay, mm -hmm. be, especially when their foundation, it's like if you got to table with four legs on it and somebody all of a sudden lops off two of the legs there's nothing holding it up and and right now we're you know there's a lot of people who are feeling and sensing that because their work is unknown the economy is getting you know nobody knows what's going to happen with that um yeah. i i personally see the economy as it's kind of like a reset almost um and it's not that i'm you know happy about it mm -hmm. yet if there's one thing I've learned in all my studies is in these times of great challenge and adversity, there's also great opportunity. Kind of. And it's about finding um, the ways to navigate that in a good way. It might be changing career, changing jobs. You know, when people actually have a time when they're not even in their work, they might actually discover who they really are and may not want to go back to that job because they've had time to get in touch with themselves, which so many okay. people just haven't had, right? Yeah, like I say, reevaluate priorities, mm -hmm. values, and I have tremendous amount of compassion for the anxiety that people are facing right now. I mean, of course, there's going to be a response of, of fear to uncertainty. I mean, that's that's part of our, you know, our brains are definitely biased towards evaluating our environment for threat. And you look out there and, and our, our networks and our structures that have 
provided us with a sense of security are, are, are not as stable as they, as they once were, or as we believe them to be. And so that it's just natural that um, people are going to be feeling fearful, anxious, um, people with anxiety disorders before all of this. You know, it, it can be incredibly overwhelming and it will be interesting to see the mental health um, impact of this, you know, and, and that, that, that will, will start to see over time. Um, and, and I think the key then is that we need to have supports, and this is where it brings back us back to the topic of innovations, what we're doing at my clinic, for people to um, discover how to meet their fear and anxiety, how to work with it, and, um, and how to and navigate this this uncertain territory. Mm -hmm. So, well, we are here to talk about your clinic and what's going on and the innovations that you've found to be beneficial from what's going, what's been happening with the COVID-19 thing. Now, you run and operate a change pain clinic here in Vancouver. So, tell us about the work that you do there um, and what you're seeing and what's happening uh, today. What's going on? Yeah, thanks. So. Uh, Change Pain Clinic was founded, actually its medical director is Dr. Brenda Lau. She's an anesthesiologist. Uh, she founded Change Pain seven years ago and with incredible vision to, uh, to service you know, the tremendous number of British Columbians that suffer every day in chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain is one of the most uh, prevalent conditions affecting British Columbians and, and Canadians. And leading to disability, leading to decreased quality of life, and um, it's definitely something that is, is complex. Pain is, is a very complex phenomenon. It's not, um, you know, the, the brain processes pain through, through numerous uh, pathways. It's not just as simple as there's an ouch here and it gets received here. There's much more happening, and um, I think consequently, uh, we don't see simple solutions for pain. Of course, there's pain medications, but by and large, pain medications themselves are not sufficient to address pain. They just don't work that well. We've already seen um, what happens when uh, doses of opiates for, for pain escalate. And of course, the, our regulatory body has, in the last decade, clawed back quite a bit on um, what's permissible to treat what's termed chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, opiates not being advisable for that just simply because of side effects and abuse potential and addic addiction potential and and really not that much benefit overall. So our clinic is multidisciplinary. So the model for addressing pain that's going to be helpful ultimately is one that's multidisciplinary, much like my background um, where patients have access um, through MSP, through our insured services, they come in, they'll see a physician like me, I'll do uh, an, an intake and then help to d develop and devise a treatment plan. And um, we have allied care practitioners such as exercise physiologist, kinesiologist, physiotherapy, chiropractic. Uh, we have uh, yoga therapists that are involved in teaching groups all under our roof. However, uh, many of those services are not covered under our provincial health care, as I think most listeners are, are aware. Or there's some partial coverage under MSP, but it's dependent on your, your annual income to qualify. So certainly not universal the way seeing a doctor is. And so what's been really amazing with uh, some changes that have happened with COVID-19 is that the province, uh, the medical services plan has allowed us to bill uh, telehealth fees for group medical visits. So a group medical visit is when uh, a number of patients are, are in a group. Historically, it's been in person, on site, and there's a doctor present and sometimes a, a second facilitator. And um, they were developed for chronic conditions like diabetes. You know, get all the diabetes patients together, then you can teach them all about diabetes for an hour instead of teaching 20 patients for an hour each, and um, and then take um, you know take blood pressure, maybe check some blood sugars, manage people's prescriptions, all in the context of that visit. So that's where the model came from. And so 
what's happened with COVID-19 is we're now allowed to deliver these group medical visits virtually. So that was never permissible before to, to bill a virtual group medical visit. So that was a pivot that we did at Change Pain Clinic immediately. We recognized, and under the great leadership of Dr. Lau and you know, a really collaborative team environment, we realized that people are gonna be at home. They're, gonna, they're not gonna be able to go to their physio or their massage therapist or all these services that have been shut down. They're going to feel isolated and disconnected, which we know contributes to mental health uh, disorder and um, which we know contributes to chronic pain. So we're seeing, my gosh, there's just a, a great potential for our patients who live with pain um, to be really affected um, by, by the circumstances of isolation. So we, within two weeks, developed uh, a tremendous series of, of offerings of group virtual group medical visits for our patients to access. And we've opened it up so that any British Columbian with a care card can access our group medical visits online by simply going to our website, entering their, their care card information, so and coming into our system, and then they can participate in one of the family physician-led group medical visits. And once they've done that, they can also access the specialist-led group medical visits. So, uh, and the reason why I'm so excited about this is because the content that we're delivering is, in my mind, you know, the type of content that people need to actually take control of their health, to be empowered, to understand what's happening on the level of their physiology, on the level of their psychology, and to have tools and practices that they can do and, and learn how to do through guidance and continue to do on their own that are going to not only improve their current condition, but also be uh, preventative and, and helpful for, for future conditions. So, um, you know, that's just, I've been teaching and instructing yoga, as I mentioned, since undergrad. And uh, I always, even when I went into medical school, I thought, geez, I'd really love to be able to teach yoga to my patients because that would just be such a valuable thing to be able to deliver. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing. You know, one of, one of my offerings in our group medical visit program is, is I'm teaching Kundalini yoga twice a week. Uh, Kundalini for, yoga yeah. is my favorite yoga. Yeah. It's, Me too. It's, it's just, <laughs> I, I, maybe I do know why it's probably just for my Kundalini awakening and, and my passion for ancient India and yoga and things of that nature. But, you know, it's of all the yogas that I've done, it's just the one that really resonates. And, you know, you can do some really simple kriyas that can really get your body working properly when you start your day that way. It's amazing what we can do just with nature and our body and good food and good mindset. When you talk about, you know, the, the mindset work that you do, it's, you have, it, it's so important. And, you know, I, I always love looking at words. And when we talk about sickness and things, it's dis-ease, disease. Mm -hmm. Right. If we are not happy and content and, you know, aligned with our mind, body and spirit, which, as you know, is what I've learned anyways, being the definition of yoga. It's that union of yes. these three yoga. things. Yes. Right. And, and it's so powerful. And so many people, you know, especially in the Western world with yoga, it might be, you know, I might doing it right. Am I holding the position They're They're in mind and body, but they're not even touching spirit. And I had a good friend who was a yoga instructor, and he didn't he didn't even get that part of it, unfortunately. But, you know, it's that that's what I love about what you do is bringing this into medicine. Mm -hmm. I think is just a, a fantastic thing. So I want to acknowledge that in, in what you do. So yeah, thank you. Well, and you know, there's as a medical doctor, I am definitely uh, I, I must remain attentive to you know what what there's evidence for. You know, mm -hmm. evidence based medicine is important. You know, the interventions that I recommend as a physician, I um, and, and I'm being responsible to my patients by making sure that these evidence are, have a basis in something. And certainly, as with the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, there's also a body of literature on yoga and the benefits of yoga, um, yoga um, anti-inflammatory effects of yoga. They look at the blood and 
certain cytokines, which are like inflammatory mediators decreasing with, with yoga practice, as well as Qigong and other contemplative movement practices. Um, even looking at genetic transcription and how practicing yoga and meditation can change what genes are being expressed in any given moment. So, you know, we have tremendous power with our physiology and I think not everyone realizes that, you know, there's still some of the old, you know, your genes are what you get and everything's determined and some people even still um, heard at one point that, you know, once your brain's all wired up, you really can't change, like you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of mentality and that you only get so many neurons and connections and then they just all start to die off as you age and if you drink alcohol you'll, you know these these sorts of messages which science has now disproven in fact we can influence our genes and how they're being expressed moment to moment as you say by the food we eat by the by where we place our attention mm-hmm. by um, our environment what we're exposing ourselves to and um we can also change how our brain is wired and that's just simple neuroplasticity you know that helps law what fires together wires together and we practice long enough and we create new patterns and like it's that. part of the beginning right what, what fires together wires together correct that's brilliant it's I true love it. yeah no I, yeah, I, I and, remember watching my own rewiring happening when i was having an awakening in a meditation and it was like a fireworks show going off in my head and i thought i was at this big uh it was a 3500 person uh conference for like six days and i'm thinking "Ah, he's just flashing light strobe and hypnotizing us a whole bunch of things oh my eyes the room's pitch black nothing and i just then when i realized afterwards what was happening was just this whole rewiring i was actually watching it happen it was Mm. uh, truly amazing life was never the same after that day Well, and that's something about peak experiences that can be really valuable because peak experiences can help create these new possibilities for connections. And then the work for us to maintain that is the the practice, the rehearsal of those new pathways. And um, because I explain it to patients this way, imagine you're walking up to the edge of a grassy field. And if you've always walked across the field in, you know, from point A to point B on the other side down the same track. If you're not paying attention, you're pretty much gonna keep defaulting to that pathway. It's the worn down path. You can walk up and walk across and not think. It's just the way you go. And that's kind of the way our brains are wired and, and conditioned through our past experience. It's very automatic. You know, we go into autopilot, which is oh, something yeah. we cover in the, in the mindfulness curriculum. And so to change that requires a level of discipline and effort, which doesn't necessarily come easily or feel comfortable. And um, so, because what happens is when you walk up to that field, you have to have a certain level of awareness to not just automatically divert down that well-worn path, which is so easy to do, but to actually choose to start trotting this different path in but with that practice and with that discipline and effort every time the new path starts to become the worn path and the old path starts to grow over again and that's exactly what's happening in the process of how our brain is connected so um and, and i also use the example of if you pick up an instrument you've never played before it feels really awkward it doesn't feel it's like uh like sometimes you just want to give up because it's like it takes effort to approach it enough times to start to get the motor memory and and start to kind of make those connections so there's more ease. It's the same with any kind of learning, right? So there's a period of discomfort and we need to um, be bought in enough to to stick it through that. Um, But then once we do, that's how our brains change. And that's how our perceptual biases change as well because um, when what we're doing is training how we pay attention and what we pay attention to, we're actually starting to expand and shift and change what we're perceiving, which actually creates our whole reality. Yes. So we have tremendous power to to create these changes, and it's not um, it's not uh, it doesn't need to be co- complex. It just requires you know some guidance and some practice. Great. Now, 
let's get back to talking about your clinic. Yeah. The this change pain clinic is in Vancouver, and see, this is one of the the benefits I think that comes out of these interesting times. And you're talking about how first you're doing things in a group in person, and now you're still able to do things in a group and virtual. Yeah. So I love that for a number of different reasons, because this is what we're learning. This is why we're having this conversation on a Monday, you know, with Conscious Living Radio and Conscious Living Network. We're having an opportunity even to expand what we're doing because everything is now going online. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge and recognize, you know, the fact that you guys were able to act quickly and take action and make things happen, and especially to get it covered by MSP. Um, are you guys still taking patients then? Yes, we are. So what's happening right now, so we still see patients in person. We've changed our uh, schedule so that our waiting area isn't crowded. And, um, you know, there was, we had to also really um, figure out at the beginning of all this whether we needed to completely shut down our services or do we stay partially open or, or what do we do? And what we determined, which was in line with our College of Physicians recommendations and the, and the health authority, is that actually uh, interventional pain management is uh, considered an essential service because we're servicing people that um, would, without the assistance of some of the procedures we do. So an example, I do a lot of myofascial release, so I release tight and restricted restricted muscles and fascia or connective tissue um, with with needles and also nerve block procedures um, there's some more advanced nerve block procedures epidurals these types of things that we offer if many of our patients if they didn't have those things would probably be, end up in emergency departments with a pain crisis and that's what we really don't want to happen right now we want British Columbians to not go anywhere near an emergency department if they can help it. So we, we did um, adapt and we remain open. So I see patients currently one day a week. That's going to start to expand as things are expanding now um, into sort of mid to late May. Um, but what we initially did was kind of uh, each take a day and have a doctor of the day and I would just see patients back to back. And I'm still doing new consults, but all of our consultations, so pa new patients that come to us for pain consultations are now done virtually. So I would, uh, on my Thursday, I would do, you know, a half day or qu three quarter day of new patient intakes virtually. So. Um, so that's kind of, we are accepting patients in for those comprehensive pain consults. And as far as our group programs are concerned, you don't have to be referred. Uh, you can self-refer. So you can go to our website, changepain.ca. The landing page is now right there. The group medical visit information is right on the landing page. Um, and then you can kind of link to the offerings and sign yourself up for the groups. Now, if you decide you want to be seen by one of our pain physician specialists um, for a consultation individually, um, that can happen. That You just need to be referred um, by, typically, we're still working out our workflows, but typically the doctor that's been running the groups that you're in can make that referral internally to one of the other doctors to, to be seen. So there's absolutely accessibility. And the wonderful thing about the virtual platform too is um, our numbers are not limited. We can really service a lot of people. And, um, and also, many of our patients who have pain, coming in to our clinic it involves leaving your place, getting in your car, driving probably through traffic. And all of that is actually can be stressful, can actually impact pain. And so for many of our, our patients, it's actually a great thing that they don't have to make a big journey or trek to participate in a yoga nidra relaxation practice or or the mindfulness-based stress reduction course. They just can do it right from home and um, and not have to incur that that toll, you know, on the body through traveling. And and we see patients from as far as Whistler and Nanaimo and Chilliwack. We have quite a large catchment area as well. So some really it was actually not even possible for many of our patients to participate in our group programs. And 
really, uh, there's one of our group programs is called Empowering You to Change Pain. And it's an eight week program. And it's essential core curriculum for anyone living with pain. All of my patients I refer into this program. Um, it's typically led by uh, one of our yoga therapists or exercise physiologists with another with a doctor in attendance. And it delivers all this key information about how to optimize sleep, how to understand the complexity of pain processing and why understanding your nervous system and stress is so important to managing pain. And, and so now, regardless of where people live and people's access to uh, transport and what their bodies are able to do, um, really what the only thing people need is, is an internet connection and a device. And I do recognize that not all British Columbians have access to that and that um, that is something to, to not make an assumption. There are people, particularly maybe people who are homeless or have uh, lower, less access to resources who don't necessarily have easy access, but it's definitely an improvement um, as far as access to these core fundamental programs that I truly, I, you know, I tell my patients, this more than anything is going to have an impact for you because you're being empowered to learn how to take care of yourself better all of my treatments I do, I'm going to do that in collaboration as a partner with you in your healing journey, but they're not going to be the cure or the fix. It's, it's, it's a two-way street. So, um, so yeah, very happy to have the, the virtual platform now. And we hope that will continue. We hope it's now going to be a precedent that it's not something that will be clawed back. That would be unfortunate. And we're definitely going to advocate that this remain the standard of, of care. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's just a great way to go, and I, I love your adaptability, the way you guys acted so quickly, and even to just have MSP support that and, you know, support the citizens of our province as well in this time when, you know, those who really need medical care that has nothing to do with COVID, and, you know, it things are shut down. Yeah. So, you know, and I also love your your approach just in terms of the natural approach, you know health and body when you talk about you know physiology always first that's how we take care of it and even in the you shared a video this morning that i actually watched and there's that one doctor who's talking about the the gut binome and yeah. he, he in all of his things he went in and said that was the most important thing the most fascinating thing he learned because it all starts with our internal balancing of all the right stuff or probiotics and everything else right yeah exactly and and the gut biome uh, as a functional medicine practitioner that's a key piece of of our, of our learning and what we teach patients and um at change pain you know if if the gut biome is out of balance, that can contribute to inflammatory burden. And inflammation in the body contributes to pain and contributes to uh, mental health uh, conditions and all, many things that we're continuing to learn. Um, and there is in our group medical visit, it's kind of like a university of group medical visits we've developed. Uh, one of our specialist physicians, Dr. Alexandra Perel Wrinkler, she's also a functional medicine trained doctor. And so she is running a group on um, wellness. It's just simply called wellness, but she's covering these topics in functional medicine, like the microbiome and gut health. And, um, and she's a fantastic physician. And these groups are interactive, right? They're live classrooms. People can put their hands up, ask questions of the doctor that's leading, get advice. And, um, and it becomes sort of a collaborative dialogue. It's not just like a didactic. Mm -hmm. and um she's also well, and there's synergy in that one of the things i love about that is there's synergy because i might have my own questions and not want to ask or yeah. i may ask the questions i want but somebody might ask an even better question that's yes. applicable, you know yeah. so i think that you know the power of groups and the power of sharing i've learned in all the training all the things i've ever done you know, sharing in that kind of environment is a very, very powerful synergistic way to grow and learn. Absolutely. You know, and, and to tie it back into Kundalini Yoga, in, in that system of awareness and knowledge, it's called, there's something called group consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, when we come together, the, the potency of, of what we're doing, our shared intention is amplified by the number of people present and, and participating. And 
yes, as you say, one person asks a question about their own health, maybe they're feeling brave or, and others may not be so courageous to step forward necessarily and they don't have to, no one's pressured to, to share. And we also assure that confidentiality is agreed upon and maintained because these are group medical visits. So this mm -hmm. becomes part of a person's medical record. They attended this group on this topic. Um, but those questions are invaluable. And uh, you know that's something I've really seen as well in the healing after trauma group that I'm leading. So the three groups I lead are Kundalini Yoga twice a week. <laughs> I teach the mindfulness-based stress reduction eight-week program. So I'm currently in going into week four and week six. I'm teaching it twice a week. But we're allowing people to join in at any point. We're not rejecting people. If people are new and I want to hop into this mindfulness course, you can. It's incur You're encouraged to take it from session one through session eight because that's um, how it was uh, developed. And they recent. build on each other, right? Yeah, they build on each other. But then you can just jump in and take it again. You know, we're not turning anyone away. We're not closing your groups. Um, and then the third one is this healing after trauma group that I'm really excited about because, uh, and I'm kind of writing the curriculum as I teach it week to week, uh, but uh, essentially the premise behind it is uh, something that, again, I felt this is such important information and right now as a doctor under our current healthcare system, it's I don't have the time to really deliver this content patient by patient. Uh, with the way that I'm billing for my services. You know, we have a fee for service model. There's no time-based fees for doctors. It's like, if I see you, I get paid the same whether I spend 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And, it, you know, as family doctors, it's actually not a heck of a lot and there's overhead and all this. So, you know, the ways to deliver um, essential information for people <clears throat> is definitely going to be in a group because it affords that time. and. In healing after trauma, what I'm bringing forward for patients is a lot of the expertise that I've gained through my studies as a trauma therapist. So that's understanding what trauma is. You know, trauma is not an event. And trauma doesn't have to be some extraordinary event like a natural disaster or car accident or assault or something or going to war. Um, trauma is held in our body and in our nervous system. And it's so it's the it's the imprint, the impression that an event leaves in us when during that time, and it might have been an incident or it might have been enduring circumstances, for example, over a person's early childhood development, enduring circumstances of traumatic stress, which for children, you know, Gabor Mate speaks to this eloquently. Child is extremely vulnerable and our attachment needs and what we're what we need in our environment are our true survival needs. So, um, and our nervous system and our brains are developing. So there's, you know, we can have developmental traumas, we can have these so-called big T traumas that are more like events, but the, the common thread is that it's, it's the impression those leave in our nervous system and body when we're unable to cope the way our physiology was designed. When our coping strategies are overwhelmed, that's when traumatic symptoms develop because essentially that trauma remains unresolved and even though in our minds we might say oh that's in the past you know and a lot of people that are str struggling with trauma with traumatic history they might get advice from other people who have no clue or maybe haven't had those types of experiences like oh that's in the past just just come on get over it now you know and in the and meantime realize, it's fired and wired yeah right yeah, yeah. So it's not just a matter of going, oh, that's in the past, I can move on now. It's how do we actually reprocess the way the body's holding that trauma so that, um, so that on a very organismic level, the, our, our, the parts of our brain that are involved in survival and our autonomic nervous system actually learn that we're safe and that the event is over because our rational mind saying so doesn't change that and that's why um, often you know talk therapy isn't necessarily going to be ultimately helpful in the context of trauma because simply talking about something it's kind of on the level of interpretation and rationality whereas what's really truly needed is to um, process the trauma through the body and to bring resource and regulation back to the nervous system and ultimately to restore rhythm one of my, te my teacher, Mariah Moser, she says, 
trauma is a disorder of rhythm. The, the system has lost rhythm. And that's where we see in indigenous cultures, rituals that involve drumming, singing, chanting, together, collective, it restores rhythm. And there's a sense of safety and belonging. We have an isolated individual society. Pharmaceuticals. You know, yeah. So, so this is the, everything I'm speaking to now about trauma, this is the type of content I'm delivering in the Healing After Trauma group visit. And it's just been such a joy to offer this. It's been full every week. We've kept it at 30, but we can expand it more. So I have one question, because you yeah. said something about um, the natural way our, our physiology or we would physically then handle or deal with trauma by like in a natural process, which mm -hmm. we don't seem to do very well as human beings. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can share a little bit of us what what should happen when we experience yeah. these things? Well, I mean, the natural response to a traumatic stressor, um, when it gets to a certain level, you know, our first response is to um, actually orient to our environment and then to affiliate, so to seek help. But if, if there's no help and there's no affiliation, then we're going to move to um, going into the fight or flight response, which is to run away or go on the offensive right and when that fails the next response is actually to go into a collapse or a, f a state of freeze and shut down it's kind of like when you see the tiger catch the, the gazelle and then the gazelle goes limp it's not dead it's just gone into that deep parasympathetic frozen collapsed play dead response and you know so essentially what's supposed to happen is that those work we either run away or we fight off we fight something off or we play dead and the predator goes away or the danger goes away. But what, and then ultimately that's, you know, there's, there's some processes then that the, the organ, you might see an animal like tremble for a little bit, get up and shake off and, and then carry on. Um, but when, when something becomes traumatic and unresolved, it's because of those natural survival impulses were overwhelmed. They actually didn't work in the moment. So therefore now that's, all of that survival energy is trapped in our nervous system. So we we actually need support and help to re, what's called renegotiate or reprocess that trauma, help those survival in, 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 impulses to find resolution or completion. And that might be through trembling, shaking, you know, bringing that imprint so it's alive and visceral, but in a setting where we've got time on our side, we feel safe, you know, we can move in and out. So, because you don't want to go into the trauma so much that you just go right back into fight or flight. Because once you do that, you actually can't take in new information. You've gone, it's kind of like flipping your lid. Um, you, you can't take in new information so that it's really actually just going to be re-traumatizing. So that's kind of the nuance of, of trauma resolution. But um, so those are kind of, so the natural ways, it's in us, but we just need a, a facilitated environment of understanding where we can be held and um, safely held through that process. And that's, you know, that really, so somatic therapy, the umbrella somatic therapy, which encompasses like somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, even EMDR therapy, um, therapies that are more of like a body oriented type of therapy are all um, have uh, inroads to, to do this kind of work. And um, it dovetails into my interest in psychedelic mm. uh, therapy, which we didn't talk about in the intro. No, but it's but, a very great segue for a couple of questions I had for you. Yeah, I mean, and this is where my interest in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy has come from. You know, as I've gone down that rabbit hole I spoke to <laughs> at the beginning, is like, okay, we can do the trauma therapy, but then some people, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources and our healthcare system doesn't cover this type of therapy. MSP doesn't cover it. So that just cuts out a whole whack of people that can't afford this to access this kind of therapy. Um, but- uh, And on that note though, with, with the, the MDMA uh, assisted therapy, MAPS is doing a lot of great work. They're yes. documenting, proving a lot of different things. And, you know, they're hoping that in the, more near future that it will be a recognized therapy that 
could possibly be covered by you know MSP or whatever it may be because we also know yeah. and I, you know we're in the same line that's how we kind of met through our, our work in the plant medicine world it's working it's oh working. yeah I mean it's right. definitely become it's it's part of my life mission in my career to see that through you know when I learned about the MDMA assisted therapy maps was doing I it's part of why I actually trained officially as a therapist and specifically a trauma therapist because I wanted to become an MDMA therapist. So, so I did. I was chosen by MAPS. I, I received the training. So I'm, I'm a trained MDMA therapist for the research MAPS is doing. And, um, you know, to, to tie it back into the physiology of trauma, I was just explaining what the MDMA does. It's not just the drug that helps people. I mean, people can go to take MDMA and they still have their trauma. Mm -hmm. It's how the MDMA supports the therapy. And so that environment for reprocessing and renegotiating your trauma that's created and facilitated through the interaction of the therapist and the, and the participant is enhanced by the MDMA because the MDMA totally widens that zone of arousal where people don't flip their lid. They don't go into hyperarousal at the mention of their trauma. They can stay regulated and long enough to reprocess it. And and yes, as you say, it works. You know, the fate we're in phase three now of the research, FDA approved research. Phase two showed us that of, of the I think it was 105 participants internationally that completed phase two. 67% no longer met criteria for PTSD 12 months later, 12 months later, which is a long outcome measure. And so, yeah, that's very exciting work. And um, I love I love to talk about that. I mean, it's not something we're offering at Change Pain Clinic right now, but in my other, I am involved in, um, you know, other pursuits outside of my clinical work, which involves this research and advocating for um, bringing this forward to to British Columbians and to Canadians and uh, even, you know, I'm looking at a proposal to study MDMA assisted psychotherapy to treat chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, Interesting. You know, lots of exciting projects on that yeah. front. Well, and you're going to be speaking at a couple of conferences coming up, the uh, the Catalyst Conference and the, the one coming up here in October. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. And I'm going to pop the links into the Catalyst Conference. I've already dropped in below, and if you're watching on Facebook anywhere, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, it's going to be down there in the comments as well. But the uh, the Change Pain website's in there, and I'm just going to give you all the, the links to get a hold of Devin if you have any questions and you want to take this uh, on a deeper dive as well. But, yeah, go ahead. Tell us about the Catalyst one, That's because that one's coming up soon, right? It's it's coming up soon. Yeah, that one's just at the end of this month. Um, Catalyst 2020 is, uh, it was going to be hosted in Calgary. Um, it's now uh, pivoted to a virtual platform. And um, there's actually a number of folks, uh, some colleagues of mine as well that are speaking, Dr. Ray St. Arno and Helen Washney. Um, they're actually, their talk and my talk are back to back on Saturday. Um, I know those ladies. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. ladies. And uh, so, you know, my talk there, I'm talking about the importance of psychedelic research, and then I'm also talking about the importance of having this trauma lens, and, like I was just speaking to, um, as far as uh, competencies for psychedelic therapists, because inevitably and invariably, um, peak experiences and non-ordinary ex experiences can actually open up um, implicit memory and trauma memories that were otherwise well walled off from the psyche for for good reason and um and you know therapists really need to be prepared and and, and well equipped to meet that kind of level of experience with skill so that's my talk is to sort of um, review that at the catalyst conference uh end of month and then uh the psychedelic psychotherapy forum uh is happening again over in victoria and I've spoken at that one, the last two, so 20, 2018, October, and then the previous one, 2016. And those are all available um, via Vimeo for folks that um, want to watch the previous conferences. Uh, this year, I actually, you know, I think I've given them an abstract, but I'm hoping that by the fall, I'll have more to share about the chronic pain and MDMA research that I'm interested in, and as well, um, more about just how this type of psychedelic assisted therapy ought to weave itself into a healthcare model of the future. 
Well, <clears throat> I happen to agree, and not just because of the work that we do, you know, with our, our conference and, and within, you know, plant medicines for healing. It's, it's simple. They work. You know, we, we see it time and time and time again with the different medicines for different things. And, you know, the Dose movie showed some great information and some things in terms of how all that kind of just watching that one journey of one woman. And, you know, I know statistically because I've interviewed a number of people who are, are practitioners and teachers as well as just people who have gone through the process and what it's done for them. And to me, that's the most important thing. When we take a look at a lot of these medicines and they're plant-based, you know, it's pretty, to me, that's nature. Nature's one of the best pharmacy, is the best pharmacy out there, in my opinion. And if we take care of the gut biome, we take care of our health, our mindfulness, and all these things, we're going to have a much more enjoyable life. And that being said, doesn't mean that we don't come up without our challenges, right? Because, you know, what did Norman Vincent Peale say? Something like, you know, show me a guy with no problems and I'll show you someone who's six feet under, you know? <laughs> you know well, isn't, that isn't that life? No. Isn't that life? We're here to learn, right? We're here we're here becoming who we are constantly. And yes. and that's and and you know, it's the, the rub of of our challenges that I really believe is a stimulus for us to to grow and i think we're so fortunate in the times we live in really with the access to information um not just access you know for some to plant medicines and access to come through our through the regulatory models for these psychedelic therapies but access to um you know buddhist philosophy or other other um ancient wisdom that we can just google search a key term where you know, centuries ago, people had to go on these treks, you know, for hundreds of miles just to catch uh, a talk being given on something. And, and so we truly do have so much at our fingertips available to really assist our conscious awakening, our conscious evolution, um, the, the, the progression that in our, in our personal journeys as human beings alive so briefly on this planet. You know, it's right there, and we just need to pause long enough, check in about our priorities and our values and what's most important to us for to, to live a good life. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate, I would say, now to have had a couple of near-death experiences. One of them was very severe. I mean, I, was, I literally was seconds away from drowning before I was rescued, and so I went through quite a process with that, and, you know, for some of us, or we've we've had you know health conditions, or my patients that are struggling with chronic pain, you know there's a lot of adversity maybe earlier in life too, where we we start to um, have this kind of stimulus to to find a way to 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 reduce our suffering and to live better, and and maybe for others, um, you know those those big life events haven't happened yet. But regardless, you know, we, we come to it in our own time and in different ways. Uh, but but the the tools are there and the information is there, and we're very privileged to to be able to to tap into so much. And I think we just need to continue to do like what you're doing with Conscious Living Network, which is to have these dialogues, to inspire each other, to share stories, to share resources, and um, and really learn from each other and support each other in uh, in, in living our healthiest happiest lives and for understanding for ourselves you know what is the purpose what is the meaning of of this life what is it where 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 should i be putting my energy and i think there's a lot of suggestions out there through our media and through our culture but we need to pause and question those for ourselves and come to our own uh decisions about what's what's what truly matters and uh, yeah and i think that's very very well said because like you know you've talked about it from the beginning or middle end here about the this plethora of information that we have available at our fingertips and it's discerning what's right for us you know right. so it's yeah I, I i really love the work that you're doing uh in in all aspects just even with the pain clinic because i i always believe you know we have to look at the body as a totality and that's mind body spirit and in the work that you're doing at the pain clinic, you know, just incorporating yoga 
I think is fantastic because it's, you know, some people talk about alternative medicine. It's really traditional medicine more than it is anything new or fancy. We're going back to our roots and we're finding the answers in nature, in our body, in all of these things. And science is still proving things too. Yeah, so, science is catching up to a lot of that ancient wisdom. Yeah. 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 And that's why, you know, science, uh, like I love science, it's great. However, I also look at it works. I don't need to necessarily know how it works. I just need to know it works. And that comes back to what we were saying about experience-based learning mm -hmm. and the potency and the power of that because I think many of us are very disembodied. We're disconnected from our embodied experience for a number of reasons. Maybe it's, it's uncomfortable to inhabit our embodied experience because we have pain or our past trauma, but also because we're so our culture is so... Um, focused on distraction and consumption and 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 all this all this um, uh, information and but to actually feel and be in here that's where our wisdom resides that's where our intuitive voice is that's where we can actually learn to listen and discern not from a place of trying to weigh information against information which you can actually be in an endless cycle with that because there's always going to be something out there refuting something else. Analysis. Um, so, I call it analysis paralysis. Analysis, yeah, exactly. But to actually come home into ourselves and then to know on that very experience level, this actually feels good. This feels aligned. This feels healthy for me. Hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do more. And that's where, um, again, you know, our breath just the breath. There's a whole, in, in Kundalini Yoga, as well as in the mindfulness program, there's this emphasis on breath because it is one of the most powerful things that we have always available to influence our, our biology mm -hmm. and to influence our nervous system, which is otherwise not under our conscious control. But when we use our breath intentionally through different breath practices, we can, we can shift the state of our nervous state system instantaneously. Yeah, well, and that is then reduces inflammation, reduces stress, and, and there's, but it's just a matter of, of learning that and, and being empowered. I'd say like the number one thing physicians should be writing on their prescription pad, probably for most people, is, is breath exercises and, and how we use your breath. Hey, when I realized the importance of that, I changed my life again. I put stickers up everywhere in my car, at the door, in the mirror, everywhere, and it was breathe. Also, it was breathe which was a reminder for me to take proper deep diaphragmatic breaths exactly. versus breathing short and shallow up here. Which and is the, what we do when we're stressed. And that's where stress comes from because I always say if you're stressed, start breathing. You know, just start breathing. Take that time and in that pause and you said it yourself, take those deep breaths. But I think it's, you know, it, it's a chuckle. And here's how important breath is. It's the one thing in life we can't live with the shortest amount of time you yeah a few minutes without breath you got a few days without water a few weeks without food you exactly. know easy to it, take for granted yes it really is and especially when you talked about that unconscious breathing patterns and or patterns in our life that are you know that that, that path across the field you yeah. know we start breathing that path which is short and shallow all the time it's ingrained in us it's how we breathe yeah. Right. And it's actually how we learn to breathe, too. So much of that comes from um, how our nervous system was uh, taught, really, how, how, what the nervous system was of our mother or whoever was with us that we attuned to as children. That's kind of the pattern that we learn and pick up. But it doesn't mean it's permanent. It doesn't mean it can't be changed with, with conscious effort. And, and that's, that's exactly what it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, Devin, I, I feel like we could sit here and talk for another hour. We totally did. <laughs> but but I'd, I'd love to invite you back, and, and we can talk about more of your work. We can chunk things down into maybe some more detail. I, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing and share with, with our community. But again, it's uh, the most important thing we want to share, especially with British Columbians, is about the Change Pain Clinic, right? Yeah, just uh, check out our website and uh, jump into the amazing offerings we have. We also have movement-based offerings led by physiotherapists, which is, again, uh, MSP-covered, which physio typically isn't for, mo for many people. Um, so, so just have a look at the, the wide variety of offerings through the group medical visits. And I also wanted to mention just quickly um, 
there's a workshop that I co-lead at Hollyhock on an annual basis called Whole Human Health with my colleague, Dr. Lawrence Chang. Um, so whole, it's in there too, perfect. So we're actually doing a, a webinar, a live webinar hawk shop tonight, actually very shortly after this, talking about ways to boost your immune health. So if anyone wants, who's tuning in live right now wants to jump into that, Lawrence and I will be talking about ways to support um, a resilient immune system starting at 5.15 p.m. Uh, online through Hollyhock. And then our, our, um, our retreat is scheduled for late September, early October. We have yet to determine if it's going to go ahead this year in person. We hope so. Well, I, I hope for the sake of all of us that we kind of get back to a new normal and get out there and we can do our thing and, you know, we can share our gifts because, you know, people need to connect and there's a lot of great work being done. And, you know, the one thing I got to say is I acknowledge you because you didn't stop. You went online and you changed things right away. We did the exact same thing. And anybody who might doubt the online experience, again, it works too. We've been having some great ceremonies and circles and, and workshops. Uh, and the way that people are able to connect through Zoom, which we're on here right now, is, is really, truly amazing. So if anybody has any doubt, just do it and see for yourself, you know, for any online experience, including, you know, Devin or with us or anybody. Just trust that it, it actually works. And depending on what happens in our world today, it's part of it's a new way of doing things. So, yeah. And, and I really hope that this carries on for you and it doesn't change even with the MSP allowance and being able to do it by groups virtually. I, I think, you know, you've pr you're proving that it works and that it has value. So uh, I, I really want to support you energetically on that too. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're hoping to do some data analysis. You know, we've also been named a center of excellence by Veterans Affairs and there'll be some, um, uh, some possibilities for actually looking at these virtual offerings and assessing them um, officially, you know, to be able to make a case that this is important service for British Columbians. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for hosting me. And it's just lovely to see you and, and lovely to connect with everyone who's out there watching right now. And uh, I just hope everybody stays healthy and get out there in nature, incorporate pausing and conscious breathing. Uh, and connecting in ways that we're able to right now. And we can't under, undervalue touch. You know, touch is such an important thing for our health, for our stress, for everything. And hopefully we'll be able to get back to that sooner than later. But uh, just best wishes to, to all. And I know touch is tough. And, and I thank you for that wish. And I always like to say it's physical distancing and social yeah. closeness. We need social yes. closeness now, everybody, more than ever. And yeah. just because we're standing six feet apart, being physically distant, yeah. is no re we, we our, our voice carries six feet to say hi, good morning. You can afternoon. still make eye contact. Exactly. How are you? We can share a smile <laughs> yes. because there's people who need it out there. You know, so uh, thank you very much for, for, for that, Devin, and thank you very much for joining uh, us here on Conscious Living Radio. We'll be airing one day at 100.5 FM on Co-op Radio CFRO in Vancouver every Wednesdays at 6 p.m. I thank Devin as our guest. There's going to be some information on our website, ConsciousLivingRadio.org, as well, where you can follow up on this, follow some links, and we'll get all the information and share it with you out there in the world today. So thank you very much again, Devin, for taking the time to, to join us. My pleasure. Thanks, Mark. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye now. Bye.